Hello, uh, my name is Royce Wilson. I'm with Google, and I'm here to talk about our project, building a useful differentially private SQL engine. I assume if you're attending Popets, I don't have to explain to you why uh, privacy-safe analysis when dealing with sensitive user data is important, but I will talk about why a SQL-based environment is good for doing this privacy-safe analysis, or useful for doing so. Uh, so the reason we chose SQL for this project is because it's a tool for data analysis that is very widely adopted across the industry, and it also doesn't require writing traditional code. It doesn't require a super, super technical background to use. You don't have to have a computer science degree or a software engineering background, anything along those lines. But beyond the usability perspectives, SQL is great when we're talking about differential privacy because it's a declarative language. You can represent your query uh, using a relational algebra expression, and we can then prove that that relational algebra expression satisfies our definition of differential privacy. So there's a number of advantages to why SQL is good for these uh, use cases. Uh, when working on our project, there were a couple kind of important requirements that we were thinking of when considering what a useful SQL engine, uh, differentially private SQL engine would look like. And the main ones are we want sensible default behavior. So it's usable by someone who doesn't have a formal background in privacy uh, and it's useful for them. So we want differentially private uh, behavior by default. We don't want weird edge cases where maybe you accidentally um, do something kind of weird in your query and all of a sudden your output is no longer satisfying the definition of differential privacy. And there could be edge cases around things like user attribution, stuff along those lines that can, can cause issues like this, or maybe um, contribution bounds not being enforced properly. We also don't want to end up in a situation where the output of the query is kind of catastrophically inaccurate, uh, which we consider kind of this silent failure case, where everything looks right, you're getting output, and it looks kind of like what you would expect but it's actually extremely inaccurate and you have no information uh, why that might be the case or that it even is the case. So this is something that we saw with things like contribution bounds, where if a user has to set contribution bounds, they could be uh, very far off and you would have no idea. You end up clipping or truncating a lot of data and you get a very inaccurate result. Um, so we wanted sensible default behavior around these. We wanted to make it easy or automatically infer these parameters when possible, uh, so we have good default behavior. In addition, we also want robust support for what we consider important SQL features of SQL. So joins are kind of a core requirement for what we consider to be useful, and we require support for them. Uh, and the same line as joins, um, we want a model that supports multiple uh, contributions per user attributing multiple records in a database to a single user. Uh, kind of some more naive applications, this might not be the case. So this was also a hard requirement for our model. Looking a little closer at differential privacy, just a very brief overview. The basic idea is if you have two databases and they differ by the contents of a single user, you apply some randomization mechanism over them. Uh, in this case, what we do is add structured noise, and the output should be roughly equivalent, where roughly equivalent is defined by the privacy parameters chosen. Our model uses epsilon delta differential privacy, so those are our privacy parameters. Uh, differential privacy is great because it allows you to have this very structured and principled conversation around the trade-off between the privacy uh, statement being made, and how accurate the results are. Uh, looking, diving kind of right into the SQL engine now and our contributions, uh, this example that I'm going to walk you through showcases the main features of the privacy model that we developed uh, in, our, in our engine. So if we consider this simple example where we're querying browser agents, uh, from users accessing a website, counting up the number of visits, we can see that immediately this query does not satisfy any definition of differential privacy. If you subtract the contribution or the visit of a single user, you're going to see an exact change in the number of visits for whatever browser agents that user was using. Uh, there's an exact change. We're not satisfying our differential privacy definition at all. 
Um, a traditional way to start to address this is we can add structured noise to each record, uh, output record, and we can bound the number of visits that each user can contribute to each output record. So this is what that modification is on this slide showing. So we're count distinct, and this bounds uh, each user to only contribute one record per row, and we're adding structured Laplace noise that roughly covers up that contribution by each user. So now we're closer to satisfying our differential privacy definition. In the context of any single output row, we're now providing pure epsilon differential privacy, so that's a lot better. But the overall query output is still not there. In particular, you'll notice that last row, this very old uh, Mozilla browser agent, there is only one user using this browser agent. So if we subtract their contribution from the table, uh, we'll see that output row drops off entirely. And it doesn't matter how much noise you add, that row is always going to drop off. And we're going to need to do more things to satisfy our differential privacy definition. Um, the next thing that we do is we do this noisy threshold using this tau parameter. Tau we define, derive from our privacy parameters, epsilon and delta. And we only uh, keep output rows that pass this threshold that we compute. So we truncate uh, every row with sparse contribution from individual users. This is where we get this uh, delta component of our epsilon delta differentially private model. And things are looking a lot better here. But we're still not completely satisfying the definition. In particular, we can imagine maybe there's a whole bunch of different browser agents. And a given user visits, visits our web page using many of these different browser agents. If we subtract their contribution from our database and run the query again, we're going to see a change in the number of visits across every single row, every single browser agent that they use. The overall number of visits changed in that query is going to be much larger than kind of the corresponding amount of noise that we have been adding. And we're not uh, satisfying the definition of epsilon delta differential privacy with the parameters that we say we are. We address this and kind of the final step here by sampling uh, the number of rows per user or uh, rather the histogram bins that each user can contribute to. So we introduce this final parameter, C sub u. C sub u dictates how many histogram bins each user can contribute to. And now we scale up the amount of noise that we're adding based on C sub u. And with these three modifications to our query, we now have this uh, browser agent access log query that satisfies our full definition of epsilon delta differential privacy as we have defined uh, in the paper. But this is pretty unwieldy for an analyst to write. So we introduce kind of this modified anonymized access syntax as a, a SQL extension. So we have our privacy parameters embedded here with the with anonymization options clause. And then we're also introducing differentially private variants of uh, SQL aggregation functions. In this example, a non-count. And we're representing the contribution bounds there using these clamped between syntax. I'll talk more about this later. Uh, the anon count later. But the when our SQL engine encounters this anonymization extension syntax, it applies those uh, modifications to the query that I was talking about in the example behind the scenes as a rewriter layer and executes a query that produces um, provably differentially private output. And refer to the paper for more details on that. Looking a little closer at the privacy model that we're introducing, as I was talking about, we're using epsilon delta differential privacy, and specifically, we're using global sensitivity in the context of the aggregation functions. We have this formalized notion of row ownership or row attribution. So each row in, or each record in each table is owned by exactly one user. A user can own multiple rows. And this uh, row ownership needs to be consistent across multiple tables to correctly support joins. Uh, and then we have our uh, explicit model of contribution bounds. We bound contribution within individual rows. We bound contribution across histogram bins. And then finally, we do noisy thresholding to protect sparse histogram outputs. And this last thing, the noisy thresholding, is where the delta component of the epsilon delta differential privacy comes into play. We can also imagine uh, a simple extension to the engine. Maybe you want to provide pure epsilon differential privacy. 
And in our previous example, we're dealing with browser agents, which are kind of an unbounded space. Uh, you could have any arbitrary browser agent. But maybe we're dealing with something like geographic data, so maybe uh, like administrative regions in a country or something. And in that case, there's a very defined output space. So we can actually, instead of doing noisy thresholding, we can enumerate every histogram output bin uh, and apply noise to every single one of them. We don't uh, threshold any of them off the query result. And we add noise even if there would have been no contributions to it. And this is a modification we can make to the privacy model to provide pure epsilon differential privacy. Um, but we think in a lot of cases, uh, like the example that I was talking about, it's kind of difficult for the query author, the analyst, to enumerate all the histogram bins. So we wanted a solution that would allow us to kind of automatically infer valuable histogram bins to return to the, the analyst. This is what noisy thresholding provides. Looking closer at row ownership, uh, we embed it as part of table schema or met metadata. So in this case, our access logs, maybe there's a logged in username that we log in addition to the browser agent. And that's what we can use to define who a user is. Uh, one notable extension that you might want to consider to this is we can partition user identifiers across namespaces. So maybe we want to differentiate between a logged in identifier like a username and a logged out identifier, such as a, a cookie token. Um, and we don't want to allow joins between those identifier spaces because they're illogical. There's no mapping between them. So this is an additional thing that maybe we can introduce in our rewriter layer that does this additional validation and enforcement to make it easy for the analyst to kind of write queries by default that do the right thing. Looking closer at these anonymization functions that I was talking about, we provide a full suite of statistical aggregation functions. Uh, in addition to the ones shown here, we also have standard deviation and variance, max and min, median percentile, uh, really kind of the full suite and everything that you would expect uh, in a SQL aggregate function library. All of these examples here have these contribution bounds and the clamps between syntax. Uh, this, in this example, we're explicitly providing those in the query. For something like human age, it's pretty easy to provide contribution bounds. There's a logical upper bound on what age could be and a logical lower bound. But in a lot of other cases, it's not easy at all to provide these bounds. And this goes back to the usability of our model. We want a way to um, implicitly infer these uh, contribution bounds for the analyst uh, so it doesn't require extensive prior knowledge of what the data actually looks like to write a query. But this is pretty difficult. Uh, we thought about kind of inferring a differentially private max and min over the input space of these aggregate functions. But you can't really compute that over the space of all real numbers. It's impossible. But we were able to leverage a couple observations. We're not actually operating over the space of all real numbers. We're operating over machine numbers, so integers and floating point numbers with finite precision and operating in a finite space. And we also don't need super exact bounds. We just need something that's close enough, roughly bounds most of the data. We can clip a couple outliers. The bounds can be a little bigger than they need to be. It just needs to be something close enough to provide a reasonably accurate result. And the result that we came, or the algorithm that we arrived on, is based on using this log scale histogram. We uh, put all our uh, input elements into our histogram, and we find the most significant and the least significant bins that pass th uh, this threshold that we compute. And the threshold that we compute is based on privacy parameters and uh, this kind of arbitrary success probability parameter uh, that we talk about a little more in the paper. But importantly, we'll note that we have to split epsilon when determining automatic bounds between the automatic bounds determination and the actual function computation. So this has an accuracy hit. But automatic bounds, we found, is still more accurate um, than kind of manually set bounds. It's very difficult to set good bounds by default. And um, generally, automatically inferring them re results in better accuracy overall. There are some downsides. We need quite a bit of input elements for this to be useful uh, on the order of a few hundred. And there is this, uh, related to this threshold that we're clearing, uh, that can cause this kind of catastrophic utility failure 
where the amount of noise added to the logarithmic histogram bins is greater than the threshold and you get kind of a garbage result out. But this is controllable and it's a pretty low failure probability. Uh, we were using in our testing a value of one in a billion and we never encountered it and it didn't result in a very high um, a threshold to clear. But this is uh, controllable based on your use case. The default parameters that we were using seem to work very well though. We also, uh, in our in the paper, we talk a lot about uh, both theoretical and experimental accuracy and utility of our model. And I think this is particularly interesting because a lot of the, the ways that we were calculating these can be used uh, to provide additional accuracy information to actually the analyst writing the query. So we can provide expected theoretical error based on things like contribution bounds. We can also, using uh, bounds determination um, algorithms, get kind of some additional information around oh, what the actual experimental error is because we're spending more privacy budget in different ways um, collecting additional information. So there's a lot of exciting things that be, can be done to improve the utility of the overall um, privacy model by analysts, uh, by providing just really rich information around um, what we expect the utility of the, the query result to be and how accurate uh, records are. We're also really excited because we open sourced our, our um, internal differential privacy implementation. So in this GitHub repo, we have uh, differential privacy libraries in C++, Go, Java. They have hardened implementations, especially around things related to random number generation uh, and sampling, which is kind of a notoriously tricky space to navigate uh, when implementing differential privacy. And really, you don't want to be rolling your own implementations of this, similar to, to crypto. So I'd encourage you to go and take a look at these uh, privacy library implementations. We also have an implementation for privacy on Beam. Uh, Apache Beam is a distributed aggregation framework. And it, our, our library here uses the exact same privacy model that I was just talking about, both in this talk and in our paper. Uh, so go take a look at that, too. We have a bunch of documentation and code lab and testing all uploaded uh, in this repo. There's a lot of great resources to refer to here. And then finally, um, some of you may have seen this. Uh, we published these community mobility reports based on human mobility and the impact of COVID-19. This was built around differential privacy from the ground up. We're looking at location data across the globe um, and there's a lot of both interesting um, material that we've released here. Here's an example of mobility impact in Quebec, which is where uh, popets would have been held if not for the pandemic. Um, and you, I would also encourage you to go to this site, take a look around. There's a lot of um, publications also on here talking about uh, the privacy model used here, references to the, the paper that we've presented. Um, so lots of inf interesting information here that I would recommend to take a look at too. Uh, so that's all. Thanks for listening, and uh, please join the Q&A and ask some questions.